I'm not entirely confident what on earth 1 Corinthians 6 is doing in the lectionary today. Generally speaking, the lectionary readings try to follow a pattern in which, and I've said this to you before, from Christmas through Easter and the Ascension, we follow the life of Jesus, according to one of the Gospels. And then from Ascension through Advent and Christmas, we go back and we pick up the teaching of Jesus that got skipped over in order to make room to follow the story according to the calendar. The Gospel reading then drives the readings every week, and the Old Testament reading is usually made to kind of have a mirror in a certain sense, a, a connection point with the Gospel. So, in today's Gospel, you see Jesus calling Philip and Nathaniel, and you hear about Jesus, the Lord, calling the prophet Samuel as a young boy. Yes? And you're supposed to pair them with each other and kind of see something happening. The epistle reading is always a bit like the odd child in the family, uh, or at the, at the uh, Thanksgiving dinner, the odd brother or sister. Sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't. Usually, though, they try to drive a little bit of a, uh, an organized series of readings in one letter. And if I had to guess, I didn't look ahead, so you can call me on this one. If I had to guess, 1 Corinthians is going to be part of the readings next week as well, and you'll have a few weeks with 1 Corinthians. But I can't think of a more awkward thing to do than to jump from the baptism of Jesus in the book of Mark and Romans 6 teaching about what baptism is to Jesus calling disciples in the book of John and prohibitions against sexual immorality. You see the kind of faulty step there? Like, huh? Why? But nonetheless... For two reasons, 1 Corinthians 6 is a very appropriate text for us today. One is that we do not talk about sex enough as Christians. In a world which is going kind of crazy when it comes to what marriage is or is not and what men and women are or are not to do with their bodies, the church is usually only heard to be shouting kind of with a bigotry voice, homosexuality is bad. It's about all we've been able to say for the last 10 years. But there is much more that should be said, not to the world around us, but to Christianity itself and our, our own mm, being willing to wink at things gone awry. So there's that, which we could really talk about a lot. And then there's this other idea that is leading into what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 6, which is far bigger than what the Bible has to say about the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And that is how Christians are to understand our freedom in Christ. Last week, with Romans chapter 6, we talked about living as those who are dead to sin, those to whom sin can do nothing. You are totally free on Judgment Day. There is no condemnation for you. So does that mean now I can do whatever I want? And it appears that that is what some of the people in the little congregation in Corinth were saying. They were saying this bit that opens our text today in verse 12 that you see the editors have put in quotation marks or scare quotes. Because it is very likely that Paul, throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, is responding to a letter he received from a woman named Chloe and the family and connections to her household. Chloe probably was fairly wealthy, an inheritress, or a, a woman with, with plenty of means, and would have had wide influence in the community. And she and others with her send this letter to Paul, basically saying, look, you were here with us for three years planting this church, working, making tents with your hands, and, and striving to, to teach us as Gentiles, as pagans, what it means to not be a pagan anymore, what it means to worship the God of the Old Testament through and in Jesus. But now that you've been gone, for a little while, things are getting crazy. There's all sorts of stuff that's going wrong, including a man sleeping with his mother-in-law, including people getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, including people taking this gift of speaking in tongues and using it to disturb the worship service and even saying that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not as good of a Christian. That should sound familiar for today's churches as well. So she sends this letter with all of these concerns, and it seems that Paul, in writing back, will quote some of the things that were being said in order to speak back against them. 
So one of the, the lesser things, I and mean, when we get all freaked out about, about sexual immorality, we maybe would get freaked out about a man drunk at the Lord's Supper, but would you get freaked out if somebody came to you and said, all things are lawful for me as a Christian, we can do whatever we want. Jesus loves me no matter what I do. I don't even have to go to a church that really teaches what the Bible says because God loves us all in Jesus. Would you freak out about that? Because I would put before you that's more dangerous than the other two. The other two are a result of that kind of teaching. Yes? So this idea that Paul writes to address that they are saying, all things are lawful for me. I'm under grace. I'm free. He writes back right away, not in the quotation marks, but not all things are helpful. But not all things are beneficial would be another way to translate that. So he doesn't say, notice this, he doesn't say, no, you're not free. You're free, but you can still really mess stuff up. You can still cause a lot of harm and duress and struggle and pain. And anybody who's ever had a relationship in which it had to break up, you can think back to high school or junior high or college, where you got close to somebody and maybe had some physical connection with them and thought maybe this is the one and then that relationship fade, does it feel good? No, it doesn't. It hurts a lot. Because the glue of pre-sex, or maybe it was sex for you, which was tying you together, got ripped apart. So while it may have been lawful, it was not, it was not beneficial, not to your heart, not to your soul. But see, it's so much bigger than just sex. It's a recognition that while we live under grace, while we live beneath this cross of Jesus Christ where we are bought with his blood in this dark age, we can still do things to harm each other. We can still make decisions which, in fact, harm the church. Or, should I say, decisions which might cause us to cease being the church. That's what happens when we start putting our freedom to do whatever I want or whatever I think is right over and above what the scriptures actually say. So that Paul says with the rest of that verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated. I will not be enslaved by anything. I will not let anything be my idol so that I would choose it Worship it, serve it, think with it, turn to it, instead of to what God has actually said. Instead of to the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Instead of that echo of what Christianity is that will extend and last beyond the end of the world. So that believing that, dying you will live. And believing that on Judgment Day you will stand. I will not let anything come between me and that. Now, I'd like to think, I'd like to say that the majority of Christians in the United States today would agree with that emotional feeling, that I don't want anything to come between me and the Word of God. But I've been around the block enough within American Christianity to know that that is simply not true anymore. There was a day when the Methodist and the Baptist and the Charismatic and the Roman Catholic and the Lutheran of whatever stripe they are could come together and say, we at least believe the Bible. We believe the Bible is important and true. But my friends, you just must know that day is no longer here. And it is not that the Baptists have all gone one way and the Lutherans another, because you should know well enough there's plenty of Lutherans who do not believe the Bible is true and still want to hold on to that name Lutheran. So the real issue is not, what's the name on your sign? Or what do you think you say you are? Or how long has your family been a member of this church body? That's not the issue at all. The issue is, what do you actually believe? Do you believe what the scriptures say or not? Because I can point you to, if you let me, we'll do it sometime. Do a Bible study where we'll gather back in there. And we'll show you a video of a man of one who's the pastor of one of the largest churches in the United States of America. They gather 30 or 40,000 people on a Sunday. Think about it. Just 30 or 40,000 people on a Sunday. They bought the old Astrodome in Houston to have church in it. And he starts every sermon by holding up a Bible and saying, this is my Bible. 
I can do what it says I can do. I am what it says I am. And then he proceeds to talk about anything but the Bible. He'll pull a verse from here, a verse from here to talk about what he wants to talk about instead, which is how you can have his book, Your Best Life Right Now. Do this, do that, everything's going to be fine. That's the preaching week in, week out. And man, do people like to hear it. Because 30 or 40,000? Imagine the cash flow in that place. Yeah? But it's not Christianity. There may be Christians there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not condemning every single one of them to hell. I don't have that power. But I'm saying their discernment ticker isn't ticking so good anymore. And that they are, in fact, in danger. Because if they believe on the last day that it really was about having my best life now and that's all Jesus did for me, and they stand before God on Judgment Day and say, well, I had my best life now, he's going to say, I guess you did. And it's not what's happening next. So it's just not as simple as, I want to follow Jesus. It's just not as simple as, I like being Lutheran. The question is, where does the rubber actually meet the road on these matters? Now, Paul then is going to apply this to sexuality and what you believe about marriage and what marriage is. And if you don't believe what the Old Testament Sixth Commandment says about marriage, well, then you are in jeopardy of not believing anything at all. It's not that if you go out and have an affair, therefore, you're not a Christian. No. But if you think you can say, I'm a Christian, therefore, I'm free to have an affair, now you're not a Christian. Do you see the difference there between a sin which would be a failing and a weakness, but which still could be repented of? I messed up, I was wrong, maybe I'm getting a divorce now, but at least I know I was wrong, please forgive me. And I don't need forgiveness for what I did, I'm fine just the way I am. That difference in spirituality is the difference between paganism and Christianity. Do you need forgiveness or not? Though all things are lawful for you, do you know that some of them can hurt you? And your most natural inclination as a human is to choose those, to choose the idols. So you come into this place and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Preach to me, not me. Preach Jesus Christ crucified and then feed me with his flesh and blood, lest I become like those who go down to the pit and never return. And that's all behind what he's going to say then about sexual immorality again to this this group of Corinthians who were letting it be said among them that they could do whatever they wanted to do. And in Corinth, we could talk more about this. Corinth was a bit of a Las Vegas kind of town, if I can just say it that way. Uh, There would have been a lot of freedom and opportunity to go to church, not Christian church, but pagan church. And you go into pagan church, and there's all the priestesses there, and you pick your favorite priestess, and you go off into a back room, and you have worship sex to help fertility and your best life now come out later. That that was really their religion there in Corinth for some of the some of the people. So you can see how the Christians who were new to this Christianity thing might have gotten a bit confused. And certainly you must know the temptation that every man carries. It's every man's battle, right? I won't even talk about pornography and the dangers that it brings to us today. But again, we could talk about sex a lot. There's much to be said. But I want to bring this instead to bear on you today a different way. I want you to hold in your mind and in your heart as you move forward this afternoon and have conversations, I would imagine, about at least two different things. To remember that not all things are beneficial for you even though they might be good things. Sometimes good things cease to be good things because we have become dominated by them or enslaved by them. Sex is a good thing. Marriage is a very good thing. But the moment that my passion would cause me to break my fidelity with my wife, the moment I would become enslaved to my passion, now it's not a good thing. And you could apply this to every single good thing of the created order. And let me give you the two that I think you're going to have to talk about. On the one hand, it is a school, a good thing. But is it something that's good for you right now? Open question. I'm not going to give you an answer today. The other one, God help me, Pastor Fisk. I like to think I'm a good thing. (laughs) But am I the right thing for you right now? And if you think you cannot go forward as a church 
without me. Yeah, thank you. Who said it? Dead or all. Do not idolize me. Please. It will only bring catastrophe to us all. So as you have these conversations today, just hold that, right? It is all too easy to take good things and think you need them when the thing you need is not a school and it's not me. It is these words, which many pastors can preach, those sacraments which are here forever. Yes, baptism and the supper. And let your conversation be molded by that hope and that grace and that knowledge that these things will never pass away. And they are your identity as a people, as a congregation. When you congregate, what do you congregate around? Word and sacrament. And that's what it means to be a Lutheran, by the way. If you want to define it, we are those silly Christians who insist and will not back down that the word and sacraments of Jesus are enough to overcome everything in every place to the very end of the world. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil, because in word and sacrament, he is with us. Ah, amen, I love it. Thank you. Well, for Pete's sake on that one, in the name of Jesus, amen.